I want to give you a really quick uh, important announcement. <clears throat> um, on May 16th, we are going to change our service times here at Vision Church, all right? We're going to change them from 9 a.m. and 11 to 9.30 and 11.15, all right? So everybody who is late today, look at your partner and be like, hey, we got 15 more. We're going to be all right. Um, so anyway, um, this is going to be our service schedule through the summer, okay? So it's going to begin on May 16th. Everybody say May 16th. May 16th. All right, so don't be in here next week showing up at 11.15. May 16th is when we're going to begin this. And uh, really, the heart behind it is uh, the last few weeks, really, at this service at 11 o'clock, it's a good problem. We've been running out of parking, running out of seats. Last Sunday at 11 o'clock, people were standing during the service, which is awesome. That's a good problem, right? They're not standing today, but they were last week, I promise. And uh, anyway, what we're hoping is by 930 and 1115, hopefully some more people will migrate to that early service because we still have some capacity there. But this morning, it was... It was uh, a little rowdy in there, too. It's filling up. So anyway, uh, we're just going to try to make it through the summer on 930 and 1115. Y'all good with that? All right, May 16th. Let me pray over you, and then we're going to jump in today. Father, we thank you so much for your spirit. Thank you that you are a living God, a risen Savior. This is not about a cold, dead religion. You are a living God, a risen King. And Lord, today we ask you as we approach your word, to move mightily on our behalf. I pray that you would speak to every person, shape us, mold us by your word today. Pray that you would be strong in my weakness, that you would be seen and that I would be hidden, that the message of Jesus would be lifted up. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Um, real quick, why don't you make some noise and welcome everybody watching via the live stream today. Let's make some noise. Welcome. Uh, to Vision Church, right on the edge of Uptown Charlotte, Westover Hills, and South End, right there. Uh, we're honored that you're tuning in today. Want to encourage you to hit share on that broadcast. If you're in here today, want to encourage you to hit share on the Facebook or YouTube broadcast because you never know who might be impacted by the message of the gospel. And by the way, every single week, we get feedback from people watching online. People are getting saved watching online. People are, are coming out of addictions and habits. I mean, seriously, the word of God is setting people free all over the world, just from right here. It's amazing, amazing. Uh, today, we're going to continue in our fourth week of our series called Asking for a Friend. Has this series blessed anybody? Has it encouraged anybody? Awesome. So I was going to stop this series today. I was going to end it today. Uh, but we've got so many questions and so many good ones. I just decided we're just going to keep this thing rolling. Are you all all right with that? We're just going to keep going with this series. Two and a half people on the right are excited about that. That's okay. Uh, the rest of you, you're welcome. Uh, we're going to keep this going uh, into May. All right. Um, this is a series that truly is unlike anything else because you provide the questions, you provide the content. So you can text your question about Christianity, about faith, about the Bible, anything revolving around Christianity, you can text your question to 704-560-8335 at any time, and uh, we'll do our best to get to your question. Um, our admin team has been flooded with questions, so thank you all. Uh, we're doing our best to get through them. And uh, today, I've got four questions for you that we're going to answer. And the first one is this. Question number one today, help me understand the old covenant versus the new covenant. I'm very confused about the old law versus the new law, the old covenant versus the new covenant. What laws and commandments do we obey today and which no longer apply? How many of you think that's a good question? That's a good question. So real fast, some of you might be like already feeling boredom setting on like old covenant, new covenant, old law, new law. Let me just, let me just tell you why this is important and why you should really lean into this today. Uh, because critics of your faith unbelievers, they look at Christians and they say, well, you guys say you believe in the Bible. You say you believe it is God's authoritative word, yet you do not practice every commandment in the Bible. Many critics of your faith say, well, you pick and choose what you want to believe and you neglect the rest. 
How many of you know your critics of your faith know Leviticus? They know numbers. They know, they know those old laws and commandments back there. And they say, well, you don't practice them. So how can you say that you're following Jesus if you're really ignoring half the Bible? Has anybody ever heard this today? If you haven't, um, probably at some point in your life you will. So I think it's really important to explain to you the difference between the old covenant and the new. If you have your Bible, turn with me today to Jeremiah chapter 31, and we're going to begin in verse 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Before I read it, though, I want to explain to you what a covenant is. A covenant is an agreement. It is a promise. And in the old covenant, we have the new covenant concealed. And in the new covenant, we have the old revealed. I need you to understand that the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New was written in perfect harmony and unison. God does not have a bipolar disorder where in the Old Testament he was angry and wrathful, and then all of a sudden he changes his mind, and in the New Testament he's full of love, grace, and mercy. All right? That was supposed to be a little funny. A pity laugh would have done. Anyway, God shows us his wrath in the Old Covenant, with glimpses of his mercy. But in the new covenant, we see God's grace on full display with glimpses of his wrath. The old covenant and the new, they're not bipolar. They're not different. They are, they are representing a perfect balance and harmony to the nature and character of your God. Okay? And the best way that I can put it before I read Jeremiah 31 is this. And I pray that if you're taking notes, you write this down. If you don't take notes, pretend right here. In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, it's about man's promise to God. I promise I'll obey. I promise I'll practice this sacrificial system, this civic law. I promise I will live this way. But in the New Covenant... It is God's promise to humanity. And how many of you know we are good at breaking our promises? Can I get a witness? When, when God gave the old covenant, when he breathed it on Mount Sinai, and he gave Moses the instructions of the old covenant, while Moses was having an interaction with God on the top of the mountain, simultaneously the people at the base of the mountain were breaking the very covenant God was establishing simultaneously. You remember? While Moses is on Mount Sinai, at the base of the mountain, all the Israelites are camped out, and they're taking off their gold jewelry, their earrings, they're melting it down, and they're creating an idol, and they're breaking the first rule of the covenant, have no other gods before me. How many of you know we're good at breaking promises? And the old covenant is broken not because of God, not because his rules were off base, but because we refused to obey them. So God says, you can't measure up in your promise to me, so I'm going to give you one better, and I'm going to make a promise to you. Anybody thankful for a one-sided covenant, a one-sided promise? Because you can't break this, you can't mess this one up. I'm going to show you. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. In the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Anybody thankful that he will remember your sin no more? Wow. Incredible. So 
Keep in mind, Jeremiah chapter 31 is written in the Old Covenant. It's in the Old Testament. While they were still sacrificing animals, still doing all the old rules of the covenant, God gave them a glimpse of what the new covenant would one day become. Now, if you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write three things down. The old covenant can be, all of its laws and all of its rules can be categorized in three categories, okay? This is important. You really should know this. As a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, you should know this. The first category of the old covenant were civic laws, civic laws, okay? Because ancient Israel was a theocracy. The Lord was their king. The civic laws that God gave them in the old covenant were meant to show them how to govern the state of Israel, how to govern the civic order of people, okay? The second category is ceremonial laws, Ceremonial laws. Have you ever read Leviticus, right? I mean, it talks about shedding the blood of the animal, cut this dove in half, put one half. I mean, you've read it, right? Have you ever seen Leviticus? And you read that and you're like, what is God saying? These are ceremonial laws because Israel was a theocracy. They were a state, but they were also a church. They were a people who served and worshiped Yahweh, the the most high God, all right? And then the third category of Old covenant was the moral laws. So you have civic, ceremonial, and moral laws. These three groups, three categories of laws, make up the 600 laws, 600 plus laws that you see in the Old Testament. Okay? How many of you know we had no chance at following all of those? Right? So an example of the moral law would be the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, don't steal, don't commit adultery, et cetera, et cetera. They're moral laws, okay? So let me just p- bring this timeline all together. First, God gives us like 603 commandments. And as he's given you the old covenant, we're already breaking them. So he's like, all right, y'all clearly can't handle 600, so I'm going to give you 10. I'm going to sum it up in 10. And then how many of you know what happened? Broke the 10. Can I get a witness? So then... God says, all right, I'm going to enter into a new covenant with my people, a new promise, a new agreement. And this time, I'm going to be the one who makes the promises to you. Every promise in, in, in this scripture of Jeremiah 31, every promise, it's God making it to you. Y'all, that is incredible because we break everything else. He, it's a one-sided agreement. He's going to keep it. It's phenomenal. So really quickly, The new covenant was ushered in through Jesus Christ, okay? His life is the pivotal moment in history. Do you remember when Jesus at the Last Supper was sitting with his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you, and this cup is the blood. This is the cup of the new covenant, the new promise. You remember that? His death, his burial, his resurrection satisfied and fulfilled the old covenant, the civic, ceremonial, and moral laws of the old covenant. It absorbed them and satisfied them forever. And then Jesus ushers in a new covenant, a new promise to all of creation, which you just read right there in Jeremiah 31, that I will wash away your sins and I will remember them no more. And I will be your God and you will be my people and your neighbor won't have to tell the other neighbor that I, to know me because my spirit will reside within you, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is now alive inside of you. Do you see it? It's incredible. Now listen. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8 verse 13. Because there are still some Christians today who they insist that we must adhere to all of these Old Testament, Old Covenant laws. If you're really a Christian, you're going to go back to the Old Testament and you're going to live like like an ancient Hebrew would. You're going to follow these strict letters of the law. And then there's people on the other side who they're like, law? There's no such thing as law anymore. Now you're under grace. You're free to do whatever you want to do. Live however you want to live. Jesus got you. Both sides make me want to get angry, if I'm being honest. 
but you didn't come to hear my opinion, so let me give you the word of God. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. In Hebrews chapter 8, the preceding verses, he quotes from Jeremiah 31. What I just read to you from Jeremiah 31, he quotes it in Hebrews 8. And then immediately after it, here's what he says. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Everybody say obsolete. The first covenant with the civic, ceremonial, and moral laws in Jesus Christ now have become obsolete. In other words, you should not be doing any more uh, animal sacrifices, okay? Like you should not be doing, if you're doing that, we need to talk in the lobby after church, something's wrong. But like the old covenant is not, Jesus didn't break the old covenant. He didn't abandon it. He fulfilled it. It's obsolete because we no longer have to go through these ceremonial laws anymore. We don't have to slay a pigeon. We don't have to slay a donkey. We don't have to slay anything else because the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world has stepped into bodily form and our high priest, Jesus Christ, offered himself as a ransom for many. It's fulfilled. Do you see it? We don't, we're not obligated to the old covenant anymore because we exist in a new covenant. This is powerful, okay? But now you hear this, and some of y'all are like, yes, thank you, Jesus. I'm not, ob I'm not obligated to these 600 commandments anymore, so I'm free. Well, hold on. <laughs> yeah, you're free, but there is still a law in the new covenant. Everybody say there's still a law. But no longer are we under the Mosaic law, which is a fancy way of saying the law given to Moses. Mosaic, Moses, get it? That was the law God gave to Moses. We're not under the Mosaic law anymore. We're now under the law of Christ, which is also known as the law of love. Look at your neighbor and tell him, that one sounds better. It sounds a lot better, doesn't it? The old covenant has passed away. It's no longer binding today. Galatians chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 through 21, illustrate the law of Christ, the law of love. You say, well, how, what is the law of Christ and what is the law of love? I'm so glad you asked. That was a perfect question. You wait, you're right on time. You know what Jesus said? He was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said it can be summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind and all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. And in these two laws, you have completed Moses and the prophets. I'm going to read it to you. Matthew 22, 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Church, that is amazing. Because basically, let's zoom out 30,000 feet. God is saying, look, I gave you 600. You messed that up. I gave you 10. You messed that up. So now in the new covenant, I'm going to give you two. And you're still going to mess it up. So I'm going to keep the promise myself. <laughs> love the Lord and love your neighbor. And in doing so, you keep all the 10 and you keep all the 600. God is not a, ch he didn't change his mind. He's not obliterate. No, he's fulfilling it. And can I tell you one more thing that's just so beautiful about this? The old covenant was kept out of fear. The old covenant was kept out of performance-based religion. The old covenant was, I've got to do this in order to please God. I've got to uphold my end of it. It was done through obligation, through fear in many cases. Oh, but the new covenant is the law of love. And we don't keep this law because we're afraid or we're obligated or there's a heavy burden on us. No, now we keep this law because we love him back. 
I don't, I don't obey his commandments so that I can be good enough to make it to heaven. No, no, no. I obey his commandments because heaven is already inside of me. My, my destiny is sealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And because I love him, I will obey him. And I will love God and I will love my neighbor. Is this making sense to anybody today? So the next time an unbeliever comes at you with all these old covenant laws and says, why do you do this this way and not this? And they want to nitpick. Just let them know we exist in a new covenant, one that is purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We couldn't keep the old, but we have to love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. Is this helping anybody? And just, I'm going to slide this in because this is so powerful do you realize that in the Ten Commandments, the first half of the Ten Commandments were all about loving God anyway? Have no other God before you. Keep the Sabbath. Make it holy. Don't use the name of the Lord in vain. Okay? The first half of the commandments were about loving God anyway. And guess what the second half of the Ten Commandments were about? Loving your neighbor. Don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. You see, you see the Old Testament, oh, it's been pointing forward all along. The Old Covenant has been pointing forward to the law of Jesus Christ from the beginning. Y'all, and you try to tell me that a Hebrew shepherd came up with this? No, 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 no. This is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from Genesis to Revelation. It is incredible. The book that you hold called the Bible is the greatest miracle the world has ever seen, and it is the word of the living God. I believe it. I'm going to say this to you. I, as an early pastor, I, this is embarrassing to admit it, but I'm going to go ahead and admit it. But as a young pastor, I used to be afraid that the more I would study the Bible, the more I would find contradictions and things that I couldn't explain and things that would maybe uh, cause me, my faith to waver. Poor ignorant soul me. The more I've studied it, the more I have become profoundly convinced that that is the God breathed. God-inspired, incorruptible word of truth, word of the living God. I believe it. The deeper I go into it, the more I just stand in amazement and say, wow, my God, my God. It's amazing. I'm telling you, it is the truth. It is the truth. You'll see one day. You will. But I know you know it. It's the truth. Is this helping anybody? What, what, what the old covenant and the new? Does that make sense? All right, we're going to keep moving. All right. The second question today is, what is the mark of the beast? <laughs> Nine o'clock didn't know what to do with that either. They were just like, do I clap? Do I smile? Do I look scared? Like, I don't know. Like, uh, and then they're like, I didn't ask that. Did you ask that? Who asked that? You know? <laughs> so uh, if you have your Bible, um, turn with me to Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 15. By the way, I'm thinking about doing a series on the book of Revelation. Would y'all be interested in that? Okay, that's, that's, that sounds good, so we'll do that. Um, sometime in the fall. Don't, don't be looking for it in Ju June or something, all right? But give me, give me a few months to study that, okay? All right. But here's the actual full question, okay? What is the mark of the beast, and what does it mean? Will it be a chip in the arm or the forehead like a debit card? Is it a vaccine? I hope your debit card doesn't work that way. Um, he, he, somebody else asked it this way. Is it a vaccine? Y'all, please, please, no, no. Stop, no. Please, just, man. Like, I see stuff online and I just cringe so hard. And the, people say, in Jesus' name. I'm like, no, no, no. The COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Stop it. Did you get the vaccine in your right hand or your forehead? Then stop it. And even still, stop it, okay? It's not that. <laughs> if you ask that question, I love you. It was anonymous. I told you these would be anonymous. We don't, I don't even know who you are. I don't. But I still love you. Revelation 13, verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their forehead, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast 
or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So I want to read right there. A couple things really quickly. If you are a Christian, if you are purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, you should not fear the mark of the beast. And I'm going to go ahead and slide this in for free. You shouldn't even really worry about it. I'm going to tell you why. Because the mark of the beast, where we pick up in Revelation 13, and it's echoed again in Revelation 20, it is describing a period of time called the tribulation. The tribulation is seven years of God's wrath poured out on earth. It's going to be horrendous. You don't want to be there when it happens. In fact, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I just want to peel back the veil of eternity. I want to go deep on Revelation for just a second because I want you to feel the weight of the tribulation for a minute. Because in church, we're like, oh, yeah, you know, Jesus is coming. You know, we're going to be raptured or something and like, uh, you know, save us from evil that's coming. Church, you have no idea. What your Bible describes is absolutely stunning and it is profound And I believe that every person on earth should be acutely aware of the end times, what Scripture says is coming. First of all, Scripture says that during that tribulation period, the wrath of God will be poured out on the earth in such a way that people, humanity, will run. They'll leave their cities. They'll leave their houses. And they will find caves and cliffs and any kind of place to shelter themselves from the imminent destruction that is coming to this planet. But something far worse. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. I want it to be on the screen and I want you to read it. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So I want to read right there. Do you realize that what this is saying is that during that seven-year tribulation, Jesus Christ, the judge of all the earth, will undo the seal of the seven seals that will be poured out during these seven years. Each seal is a new wave of wrath. Jesus is the only one who is able to open the seal because he is not just the one who judges the world, but it was through his blood that the world is saved. The one who saved the world is the one who is, who is credentialed to judge it. The Bible says that when he gets to the seventh and final seal in that seven-year tribulation, as he opens it and declares that wrath, All of heaven will grow silent. For 30 minutes, not a sound, not a word, not a verse of praise will roll from the angel's lips. Do you realize that heaven has never been silent? It has never been silent. In fact, right now, even as you gather on the earth, there are celestial beings and angels that surround the throne of glory. They surround the Most High God, and they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory. They praise Him. Heaven is triumphant in praise and worship. But on this moment, all of heaven will recoil in silence in reverent fear and awe and wonder of the wrath of God poured out upon the earth. It's going to be far worse than any of you could ever imagine. This is why I urge you, and I plead with you today, give your life to Jesus Christ. James said, your life is but a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. You cannot put off living for God. You can't say, well, I'll make it right with God someday. No, no, no. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. The moment is is yours right now to repent and trust in his name today. But you will not always have that moment. You will always have it. I wanted you to feel the weight of what scripture tells us about the wrath of God coming to planet earth. Now I'm going to say this. We are a church that believes 
in the rapture of the church preceding the seven-year tribulation. In other words, I believe you who are saved will never see this. And these, y'all, these churches and people that say that the, the rapture is like in the middle of the tribulation or it's like at the end of it, like I just, i sorry, I have to adamantly disagree with you. And here's why. Why in the world would Jesus make his church, his bride, suffer his wrath when 2,000 years ago on the cross he already bore our sin, he already bore our iniquity, he already took on the wrath of God himself for you? Do you understand the power of your faith and salvation? When you accept Jesus Christ, he washes you white as snow. You stand in the spirit blameless before God. He looks at you, he says, I see no fault in you. Because that's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. The church will not be here to see this day. Thank you, G. Anybody thankful? And look, I can already feel some of you, maybe online, you know, I don't know, sitting here going, well, you know, the rapture of the church, that sounds a little, a little weird, a little far-fetched. Let me just help you out on something really quickly. God is so powerful that he could literally speak the earth and the galaxies and the universe into motion with his mere spoken word. I think a God who created it can do whatever he wants with it. He's able to take his church. And by the way, Scripture tells us in the Gospels that two will be working in the field. One will be caught up and the other will be left. It tells us that two will be like kneading grain, whatever that means, something about grain. And uh, one will be left and the other one will be taken. The Lord will come like a thief in the night. You'll not know it. You can't say, well, you know, uh, yeah, I'll get right with God someday. Mm -mm, no, mm, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. You don't know when you'll take your last breath. You don't know. And he could come before this sermon's done. He could. Do you know what the Bible says about a false prophet? It says false prophets basically prolong the days. False prophets tell you, oh, you've got plenty of time. He's not coming right now. The, the word says in 2 Peter that the Lord is not being slow about his promise to return for the church, as some people think. No, he is patient for your sake and for mine, waiting for you to repent of your sin and trust him with your whole heart. It's his mercy that he tarries. This point is about the mark of the beast. It's important for you to understand that the church will not be here during that, okay? But here's what you do need to understand really quickly in case some of you are pretending to follow Jesus and you aren't really and you're left behind. Here's what you need to know. When you take the mark of the beast, it is eternal damnation, forever judgment. It cannot be forgiven. It cannot be retracted. Scripture also tells us that it will be required to participate in the global economy. You will either take a mark on your right hand or on your forehead. Otherwise, you will not be able to participate in the world economy. And something even far worse than that, Scripture says you will suffer if you reject the mark of the beast. Because Satan operates through manipulation, pressure, and guilt. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and freedom. Revelation 20 says that if you reject the mark of the beast, you will be beheaded for your faith. But you may suffer on earth, but you'll, you'll enter into glory unspeakable on the other side, dying as a martyr. Scripture, I think, it is, I think it's powerful that Scripture says that the chip, or not chip, excuse me, but the mark will be on, you, I'm looking at my notes, um, <laughs> the mark will be on your right hand or your forehead. This is important because I want you to know that the technology for this already exists today in 2021. It's called an RFID chip. RFID. It is the size of a grain of rice, and it can be implanted in this thick part of your hand, and it can contain medical records, bank information, everything right there in your hand. The technology exists today for this ancient text to be realized on earth. Here's, what I, here's why I bring that to your attention. Am I trying to scare you? No. No? Because you should rejoice. But if it does make you a little nervous, that's okay too. Because that's conviction. 
What I'm trying to show you is that Jesus is coming again. Look, look, I'm going to help you. Either we believe the Bible or we don't. We either believe it is God's word or we don't. You just make up your mind. Choose. Which is it? Because we're all betting with our lives. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I believe in this word. I believe it. Every generation is mocked it. Every generation is defied it. Yet it is defied all. It's transcended time. The word of God is faithful. It is true. Really quickly, um, just one more thought here about the mark of the beast. And people always are afraid of the mark of the beast. They're like, is it the COVID vaccine? Is it that RFID chip? What is it? Let me just tell you something. You are not going to accidentally take the mark of the beast. Like, you're not going to be like, oh, oops, I took it. Like, or I gave it to my dog when I put that chip in him. You know what I mean? Like, stop, please stop. Like, <laughs> like you, you know, they put the chips in the dogs in case they run away. Or your cat, if you're a cat person. We'll pray for you at the altar later anyway. We all know dogs are bad. Anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm just kind of. But like, you're not going to accidentally, like, oops, I took the mark of the beast. No. According to Revelation 13 and 20, it is a willful cognitive decision to reject Christ and accept this global order and the mark of the beast. Okay? So it's not the COVID vaccine. Stop it. Question number three, where should a new believer start reading the Bible? Where should a new believer start reading the Bible? This is a great question. For the sake of time, I'm going to move through it pretty quickly. Um, first of all, I don't think there's really a bad place for you to read the Bible. Like, just read it. Okay, that's great. But I do want to caution you. I've heard so many people be like, well, you know, when I'm reading the Bible, like, I just, you know, I just take it and I just flip it and then I just you know, put my finger on whatever verse, and I just say, Lord, speak to me, and I just flip it open, I'm like, there. <laughs> Stop it, please. Don't do that. No, no, no. Like, okay, maybe one time God spoke to you through it. Great, hallelujah. But that is not how you should approach the Bible, okay? It's just not. And I'm sorry if I'm hurting your feelings. It should not ha be how you approach the Bible, okay? Here's what I recommend all new believers start when they start reading the Bible. Start in the book of John. It is the gospel. Yeah, my people in the back with me, I love you. I love you. Y'all are like right with me. I love it. So in the gospel of John, you should start there. Why? Because John is the only gospel that starts at the beginning. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And all things that were made were made through him and by him. All the other gospels start at the New Testament, but John starts at the beginning of time. And then the Gospel of John um, passes into the book of Acts, which is the account of the early church, and then the epistles, the letters to the church, okay? So it's a great place to read. So really, I would just encourage you, start in the book of John. That's the best place. And one more thing here. When you study the New Testament, it really honestly does not require any pre-context of the old. It doesn't. In fact, I would say you should start in the new and then go back and read the old because then you'll see Jesus all throughout it. Jesus said, Moses and the prophets, a.k.a. the Old Testament, it all speaks of me. So when you understand the principles of the New Testament, then you can go back and Leviticus might make a little more sense. I'm serious because the sacrificial system points forward to the price he would pay for you on the cross. It all points to Jesus. The entire Old Testament points forward to one person, Jesus Christ. When you understand that, it'll unlock it and change your life. I don't recommend starting in Leviticus or the prophetic books, Jeremiah, Revelation. Don't, don't do that. No. Okay. We, we good on that? Start in the book of John. Final question today. <clears throat> Fourth and final question this morning. What happens to people who never hear the gospel? What happens to people who never hear the gospel? This is a question that was submitted multiple times, and I think it's really important. And I would encourage you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 20, because the Bible actually answers this itself for you. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. It's incredible right there. Romans chapter 1. What happens to people who die without hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Number one, they are without excuse. I know that may not be the answer that you're looking for. It's not the one that gives you butterflies. But scripture unashamedly declares in Romans 1 that every person on this earth will stand before the judgment seat of God having no excuse for not knowing him. And then it goes on to say, here's why. Because creation reveals the creator. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak, and night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all of the world. Wow, that's one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible right there. Romans chapter 1 and Psalm 19 agree that the invisible qualities of God are made visible for all to see through creation. Creation declares... What a great, powerful, and awesome God you serve. His invisible attributes are on display through creation. He reveals himself through creation. By the way, creation reveals a creator. I'm going to say it this way. Design reveals a designer. I'm going to put it to you like this. Imagine if we went to an art gallery, somewhere like the Mint Museum or somewhere like that that's really beautiful and all that. And we walk through together and we're looking at these magnificent works of art and we come up to one that's really beautiful and I just lean over to you and I'm like, hey, look, that one, I just want to tell you about that one. See, um, that one actually has no artist. Nobody actually designed that one. Um, that one's different because, um, see, that one started as just like a, like a, weird place in the drywall and then like over time we just kept scraping it just kind of came through and it evolved over time and then there it is and now it's like it's beautiful no doubt but that one has no origin that one has no creator no designer what would you what would you think about me if I tried to convince you that you'd be like homie has lost it you'd be like he, he's gone like somebody get him, get him help but you let Atheists, unbelieving professors who have already determined in their heart that they will not submit to God. You let them tell you the same thing, that creation, design, had no designer. And you believe it. And you believe it. What takes more faith? To believe that that piece of art had an artist? Or to believe that it just happened? You choose. The virtues of God are on display. They're obvious. Design implies a designer. While I'm here, I'm just going to slide this in real quick because I got this big orange clock in the back and I got like two more minutes. Have you guys ever heard of the Fibonacci sequence? To me, it's one of the most powerful tools in articulating intelligent design because it was, it's a mathematic equation that was found by an Italian mathematician. And basically what it is I wish I had the diagram. I should have been more prepared, but this is just totally off the cuff here for somebody. The Fibonacci sequence shows a spiral curve at a mathematical formula, and it shows you that this Fibonacci sequence is on display through creation everywhere, everywhere you look. It's in the big, grandiose things. It's in the small, minute elements of life. 
The Fibonacci sequence is found in pine cones, sunflowers, flower petals. It's found in hurricanes. It's found in ocean waves. It's found in outer space. The galaxies spiral at a perfect curve of the Fibonacci sequence. There is a mathematical equation that shows up in creation time after time after time again. And both atheists and believers acknowledge its existence and I want to say something to you. Does randomness give way to order? Does an explosion give way to order? No, only design gives way to pattern that is predictable, that is replicated over and over and over again. There is a creator. And his virtues and his majesty has been on display for you every single day of your life. Psalm 19, every day of your life, the heavens have declared the glory of God. Every night of your life, they have displayed his awesomeness. I'm going to give you one more example. Are you hanging in there? You okay? One more. I don't believe that the heavens and creation just declare any God, any old God. No, 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 no. It displays the God of the Christian faith, the I am. I believe it. I'm going to show you real quickly. Every single night on that western horizon, the sun, the light of the world that gives life to everything, descends and rests over that western horizon. And as it slips down behind the horizon, darkness covers the earth. I'm reminded Jesus said, I am the light of the world. As he hung on the cross between heaven and earth suspended, the Bible says that as he was crucified for you, darkness covered the face of the earth. At three o'clock in the day, the darkness covered the earth. And every morning, faithfully, over that eastern horizon, that sun rises again, breaking and piercing the darkness with rays of hope of a new day, a new tomorrow, a second chance. Just like Jesus Christ was risen from the dead on the third day. The light of the world has stepped into our darkness. He brings hope. He brings life and light to all creation. The sun itself, the light of the world, preaches to you every day of your life the gospel of Jesus Christ the Lord. Every single day of your life. Not only does creation display God, but your conscience. Romans chapter 2 says that God has written the moral law on the human heart. Y'all, this is a profound reason to believe in God. Every, every person on earth, no matter where they are, whether they've heard the gospel or not, whether they've seen the scripture or not, they all know it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to cheat, it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to do certain. There's a moral code that has been written on the hearts of men, and that is exactly what Romans 2 says. If this were all randomness and this were just an act of evolution, then why do we all have a common moral code that is inscribed upon our hearts? And really quickly, I just want to set you free with one more thought. People, when they ask this question, they think that God is unjust. God is unruly. But you know what he says in his description of heaven? It says at the close of the book of Revelation, as John the Revelator beheld the picture of heaven, he said, and I saw every tribe, every nation, and every tongue surrounding the throne, giving praise and glory to God. Did you hear me? Every tribe, every nation, every tongue will be there. Really fast, how did the Old Testament saints make it to heaven? Because they didn't hear the gospel either. How did Moses, how did David, how did Noah, how did they make it? Through creation, their conscience, and hear me, they were saved by God's grace when they had faith in him. Abraham was declared righteous by his faith. Same way we're saved today. And real quick, just, a, just totally, just going to slide this in. Luke chapter 16 describes a place of purgatory, a place of holding at the lower parts of the earth. This is in your Bible, Luke 16. This is not an allegory. It's not a metaphor. Jesus told you this is what it is in Luke 16. It's called Abraham's bosom. It's a place of holding for the 
righteous dead before Jesus. The people who died without hearing the gospel. What happened to them? They were held in a temporary place. Read it, Luke 16. And when Jesus died on the cross, descended to the lower parts of the earth, he wasn't in hell fighting Satan. No, because it was already finished. He descended to Abraham's bosom, the place of temporary holding. He looked at Abraham. He looked at David. He looked at Moses. He looked at the righteous dead by faith. And he said, I am the Messiah. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. He gave gifts unto men and led them into the presence of the Father. Why? Because there is no other way to the Father but through the Son, Jesus Christ. Christ. I want you to pray with me right now. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we repent of our sin. We ask you for forgiveness. We admit, God, that we have broken our promise to you. We've sinned. We've been selfish. We've abandoned you and neglected you. But Lord, today we ask you for forgiveness. We believe that Jesus died on the cross to wash our sin away. And today we receive him by faith. We believe that on the third day he was resurrected from the dead. He lives. He's Savior. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me to follow you, obey you, love you, and serve you all the days of my life. Lord, it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Why don't you stand to your feet all over?